Moshe Safdi is here. He is an architect. He is a theorist. He is an urban planner. He has over 75 buildings and master plans to his name. In 1967, he was made famous by his residential complex Habitat. It redefined urban living and put him on the cover of Newsweek magazine. 44 years later, there is no sign of him slowing down. He has four major buildings opening this fall alone. I am pleased to have him back at this table. Welcome. Thank you. We have much to talk about. I begin with this. Uh, you said to me, there are great debates going on in architecture right now that have not received enough attention and focus. Right. What are they? I think the debate is between architecture as an expressive art, sculptural, attention-getting, uh, and architecture as dealing with the urban issues of the day, density, congestion, mega scale. How do we create a humane environment in this ever-growing, ever-dense uh, environment? So the debate is between the idea of architecture uh, and its priorities. And its priorities. There's a debate that says we have to create a sustainable architecture, right. energy, resources, etc. Right. And so there's all these streams and all these interests, and the public is confused, but the architectural criticism doesn't quite focus on what the questions are. For example, to me, the biggest issue of the day is mega scale. As we get denser, I mean, particularly we're insulated here in North America, you go to Asia, mm -hmm. and these enormous cities, high rise, higher, one higher, on higher, top higher, of right, the other, right. millions of people on top of the other. How do we make this humane? I mean, this is the biggest agenda of the profession at the moment, is to humanize mega scale, to deal with these issues of but, but that, light, that, nature. Okay, so how do you humanize scale, and especially with populations that exist in the You place, deal Asia, with daylight, India, with China. sunlight, with the massing of, uh, you create open spaces and gardens in different levels in a building. You, uh, you break down the scale so it's more identifiable. You make buildings that you can find your way around, whether it's a big airport or whether it's a mega hospital or residential mixed use that is sprouting all over mm -hmm. China and, and India and so on. These are the issues of the moment, and how to do it with limited resources, with less energy, uh, with materials that are replenish replenishable. And I'm not saying all of this should not uplift the spirit and be sculptural and exciting, but it's how you get there and what the priority is. Okay. So the other issue has always been star architects. You know, the oh, name that you people uh, want to buy brand. They want to buy the people that they think will get their building talked about. Is that still at play, and is it especially at play in Asia? It's certainly at play. It's at play in the sense that it's recognized by governments, by developers, mm -hmm. that there's a value to having star architects designed right. for you. You're one of them. I'm one of them, and yet that the same question is, what is it you're trying to attain? And we all have different agendas, what we're trying to attain as we get the opportunity because we're star architects. Because you go in there and you know that you've got the opportunity to do things that is not day to day, that is kind of breaking new grounds. Mm -hmm. uh, in Singapore, we had a 10 million square foot project, mixed use, hotels, convention centers, museum, Marina Bay Sands, right. longest swimming pool oh, on know, the 59th know, know. floor. But to me, to when me, I was there, I asked the, <laughs> Lee Kuan Yew, where should I go? And that's what he said, said, go over there. It's his favorite. Now, is it an icon for Singapore? It's already become the Eiffel Tower of Singapore. But right. to me, the agenda was to show that you can create an urban meeting place, a gathering place for the city that pulls everybody, tourists and the residents of Singapore, that it is about culture, about commerce, about nature, about views, about light, how to create a new meaningful place for the 21st century that's urban, that's not a commercial mall, and is not a 19th century flashback. And so I treated it as a laboratory for a new kind of urban place. And they went with you? They went with me all the way. And the government crucial. of Singapore and my client, Marie, uh, the Las Vegas Sands, but right. government of Singapore set the guidelines. They wanted a place that connects to the rest of the city, right. that draws the population in, that, that, that celebrates the waterfront that they've created. Mm -hmm. All of these things that were solidly behind us. Lee Kuan, you told me something that, that meant, in fact, what used to be a great sort of, uh, I think, ship center. He's moved to the other start right. to open this up for development, right? Correct. 
for and smart development. All landfill, right. and then one of the brilliant things that they did is when they set up the land for sale to developers, they said, we are fixing the price of the land, mm -hmm. and we will pick the project that contributes the most to Singapore by design, by program, by management, by so, so we're going to play a role here. And, and they're going to, they played the role by fixing the price of the land. They were in the driver's seat from day, from day one. Mm. And if we were doing this here, we'd say the highest bidder has to get it and quality gets second mm. place. So they placed their objectives and quality as the prime reason for selection. What informs your architecture most? I think an obsession with understanding the place, the culture, and creating a building that belongs to that place. I mean, I am obsessed with kind of making buildings that belong, that, that grow out of that place, whether it's a museum of the Sikhs that we're opening right. in Punjab, or a museum in Arkansas, or uh, a museum in, uh, in uh, uh, say, uh, Salem. Uh, how to feel the place and inform the architecture through an understanding of the site and the culture and so on. I, I think apart from the issue of mega scale and livability and gardens in the air and so on that began with Habitat, mm. for me, understanding place and creating a unique design to that particular place. Tell me about the Crystal Bridges because you mentioned Arkansas. I mean, this is remarkable. Here's a woman, the patron, who wants to build a museum of American art. Right. She has all the money in the world. Uh, she was the daughter of the founder of Walmart, right? Yes. With a great interest in them and, and has the power to get art, to acquire art, and wants a building that is up to the standards of the art that she is acquiring, correct? Correct. So what happens? Uh, how does that work? And how do you end up with this project? First, Crystal Bridges. She, with Crystal Bridges, Alice Walton did not begin by making... Sam Walton's daughter. Yes. She did not begin with competitions or interviews. She began by traveling from museum to museum and studying the architecture. Around the world. Around the world. In the United States, around the world. At some point, she said, I want to make a museum which is a place of community as much as it is a museum. She was at the Huntington Library. And they said to her, you should go and see the Skirball Museum mm -hmm. designed by Safdie. Right. She went there incognito. Mm -hmm. Thereafter, I got a phone call. Will you come and spend the day with Alice Walton in Bentonville? Right. And we Did had you dinner. say, where is Bentonville? Or? Uh, well, <laughs> I went to visit the Walmart store because I'd never been to one. <laughs> yes, right. That's a good thing to do. And, uh, you know, I arrived. We had dinner. The next day, we went walking around the site. Uh, and I said to her, as I was about to leave for the airport, um, I guess you're beginning your architecture selection process. And she said, no, I ended it today. And meeting that was she it. decided on you? She decided on me. So what it was did she first meeting. She'd visited several of my buildings and decided. So she had an, inst she had an instinct that she wanted to choose you, and she just wanted to make sure yeah, that her instincts seen the work. matched the she person. She was impressed with the work. Mm -hmm. she, she saw qualities in it that she thought were looking mm. for that she was looking for there and after meeting face to face at the end of the day that was it mm. you as an architect as a good architect you want your client your patron uh, to tell you what they want uh, or simply to say this is a you know tell me what you would do Louis Sullivan great American architect right. mentor of Frank Lloyd Wright said no great architecture occurs without a great client. Oh. And what's a great client? What are the, the great elements of a great client? A client is a client that trusts their intuition and instincts, who know what they want, that are open to have a dialogue with you. Mm. And in fact, want to be surprised. They want to be surprised. They're curious. First of all, they should look at your work before they hire you and feel good about what you've already done in other circumstances. But thereafter, it's an exploration, and it's a joint exploration. I do best with strong clients who have a strong sense of what they're after and also are prepared to have this discussion. And we both come out different at the end. Uh, I've had, you know, I had it with the Saltec Library working with Nancy Tessman, the chief mm -hmm. librarian. I had it with the National Gallery of Canada. 
And I have it with Alice Walton. She is very strong. We traveled the world. We looked at different museums. This was after you had... After I was selected. Right. We went to Louisiana outside Copenhagen, and we talked about experiencing art and nature together. You're in nature, and you're experiencing the art. We realized that's what Arkansas was all about. It's a site in nature. How do we make nature and art sort of merge as an experience? And that's what the project uh, evolved to become. Tell me what you would like for us to see as we look at the images. This was a creek, a stream, uh, outside the city, covered all around in mature trees. I decided to build in the bottom, at the valley, in the creek, mm. dammed the creek to create two large ponds fed by crystal springs, which mm. is there. Mm. And around those ponds, a series of pavilions built with local wood, uh, Arkansas pine, uh, built with concrete walls surrounding the ponds that we created. And everywhere, you're into galleries, out into nature, looking at the trees, mm -hmm. uh, surrounded by them. So it's like a little oasis. Another project you're doing, you have four projects coming to fruition within the year. The next three months. The Kaufman Center. Performing Arts Center, Concert Kansas Hall. Kansas City. Kansas City. Performing Arts Center with a concert hall and a proscenium theater for opera, ballet, and theater. So two halls, specialized halls, which means they really have top quality facilities. Uh, I've already heard, as we say in the lingo, I've heard the hall because I've started practicing. Hmm. And it's going to be, I think, the finest acoustics uh, ever, like uh, top acoustics. Now, did you go find who is the genius about acoustics and hire him or her, or do you do yes. it some other way? No, I picked who I thought was the best in the business at this moment, which is Yasu Toyota, Japanese acoustician. Did, he didn't also he did do Disney, Disney? Hall. Exactly he did Disney right. Hall and Frank fact, selected him was, for Disney. Yeah. And, and I had lots of conversations with... Just, what is it he has? What he has is a new paradigm. The old tradition was you have to do a shoebox. That's the only way to get the sound into to the room. And everything so it does, it's this right. kind of a room. And all of us want to do a place like that where the people surround the orchestra. And he cracked the acoustic problem. He found a way to do it without the shoebox. That's his secret. And how did he do that? He did this by creating, helping us to create many, yeah. many platform levels of seating each of which little walls that, that sustain them are bouncing the sound back and forth. So that instead of just two parallel walls, it's a much more complex arrangement of walls. Uh, the other thing you're doing is USIP, United States Institute of Peace in Washington. This was, for me, a very, very moving project because it started about 10 years ago. And when they first called me, I said, United States Institute of Peace, what is that? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> when I give a lecture and I ask who knows about it, like yeah. two hands up. Right. It is a body created by Congress to pursue peace and conflict resolution. And they were able to get the most prominent site in Washington, right on the mall facing the Lincoln Memorial. And uh, so to me, it was by definition a building that's going to be the symbol of peace on the National Mall. That's a tall order. I'll tell you a quick story that, that the, the late, great uh, Ed Bradley, the correspondent for 60 Minutes, um, would tell the story that, that uh, when he died, he died several years ago, when he died, and he would go hopefully to heaven and God would say, um, Mr. Bradley, why do you deserve to be here? <laughs> and Ed would say to him, he said, have you seen my Lena Horne interview? <laughs> so when this moment comes for you, what building are you going to ask God to look at? You know, it's like having a bunch of kids. No, no, don't tell who's, me who's that. Who's your favorite? Oh, God. I guess Yad Vashem. Well, really? Because of what it means? Or? Because of what it means and, and the significance of creating a place that tells the story of the Holocaust, which is such a, a central piece of the history of our time, and trying to find an architectural framework that could be the, 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 the place hmm. of that story. When did you build that? I, I did the Children's Memorial right. 25 years ago, but the museum itself we opened five years ago. Complete rebuilding of the old museum, mm -hmm. new exhibits, complete rebuilding five years ago, opened five years ago. The uniqueness of Yad Vashem is that it's in Jerusalem, right. in Israel. Exactly. And when you go through the story, 
through the narrative, the question is what happens at the end. Mm. And after the Hall of Names, which is a memorial place with all the three million files, I, t I take you out, I go through the mountain, and I emerge out of the mountain. And at that point, the building, which is kind of a prism that is dug right mm. into the mountain, so the whole museum is underground, it breaks out, opens up, and you see the Jerusalem forest, and you see the mountains. And that's a statement that I could make as an architect that you could not make anywhere else. Here we are, we prevailed, life has, life prevailed. And mm. a kind of an optimistic reflection that still life prevailed and we go on. And that, that's where Yad Vashem is so unique because of its place. Uh, Bob Stern is the dean of the uh, Yale Architectural School Good of friend. Design. You taught at Harvard. You now yes. live in Cambridge. Yes. Uh, did that experience contribute to you as an architect because uh, you had to finally give it up because you had too much business? Well, it was a great experience. I went there in 78. It caused me to leave Canada. I was yeah. then at Canada, in Canada. So I moved to Cambridge, set up my office there, and for 11 years I taught. I headed the urban design program. And uh, it was wonderful because, you know, it is the center of things. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and, you, can going and on. You, can, you can initiate all the debates that you think ought to be Lots part of, of debates where we are in architecture. I got into trouble writing uh, various critical papers. But yeah. at some point I felt as the practice expanded and I started traveling far east and so on and be away every month that I can't do both. And I made the choice. It, do you have an operative philosophy about architecture? Well, I begin by saying there is an ethic to architecture. Right. What is that ethic? Yeah, what is it? The ethic, I think, first of all, has to do that you're designing buildings for a purpose, to fulfill the life intended in a building. If you're doing a school, it's going to be a wonderful place for learning. Right. Nothing else matters. So there is the purpose of a building and how you understand the life within it and respond to it. It's material. We need to use resources, real materials, and it's an expressive art in that sense. It's all about construction. That's another aspect of it. Mm -hmm. But for me also, place is part of that ethic, because I don't believe that uh, conceiving something in the abstract and landing it into a place is as rich an architecture as understanding a place and growing the design out of the, mm -hmm. out of the qualities of the place. And finally, you know, I think that we have a role as a responsibility that at this time of urbanization, of, of a, a kind of scale that has never occurred in the past. Architecture today is not what it was even 30 years ago. You know, I was in China in 73. There wasn't a single high-rise building in any of the major cities in of China. Year? 1973, Cultural mm. Revolution. Mm. Mm. I went there with Trudeau when he opened the diplomatic... Former Prime Minister Trudeau of China, of, 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 of Canada. Of Canada. Right. And I went back 25 years after, and every mistake that we had made in the West had been repeated. So this is a new world of density and of size and of scale of everything that we do. And, and do they have, have responsibility. Do, do the Chinese, in your judgment, have an awareness of uh, learning from the mistakes of others? I think the beginning to in a big way. They are interested now in the issues of sustainability. They are beginning to be interested in the regulatory uh, mechanisms of uh, controlling the quality of housing and mm -hmm. uh, they've been consulting the Singaporeans a lot uh, but it's still so fast growing and so wild that it's a long way before it yeah. becomes harnessed. Frank Gehry is a great friend of yours. Yes. Frank Gehry says that his art is most influenced, his architecture is most influenced by art. My architecture is probably influenced by the architecture that's been designed without architects. Mm. I learn a great deal from visiting villages and towns and seeing an architecture that evolved over centuries and adapts itself to the land and adapts itself to the material as at hand. It doesn't mean that I imitate those building forms, but I learn from the process. I learn the most from studying design in nature. That's design what inspires me. Yeah. You know, I'm a sucker for morphology and you know I read Scientific American from beginning to end and I'm fascinated yeah. by uh, uh, by the whole question of, of evolution and how design 
responds in nature and how we might learn from that in architecture. Did I read somewhere that, that, that the, the sort of the earliest hero you had was Le Corbusier? I kind of was a, a, a critic, sort of admirer well, critic. critic of right. Le Corbusier, both. Yeah. I worked for Kahn. Because you thought I apprenticed that, for Kahn. Was, actually was thinking about Kahn, yeah. actually. Kahn. I apprenticed for Kahn yeah. and I learned a great deal from him. Because you thought that what Le Corbusier did was to was too sterile and stood too independent of I thought everything that, else? that in the 20s and 30s he was talking about the gardens and in, 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 in high buildings and he was talking about uh, building with nature but when, he, when in the 50s and 60s he built these cities that were sort of uh, theoretically and otherwise pretty inhuman places. Inhuman? Inhuman. Because they had no... No great architect. They were they were all about repetition, the towers in the park concepts. They were about, uh, you know, the, the, the unité d'habitation, the famous apartment building in Marseille. Right. Really quite a compact, uh, without relief, pretty uh, overwhelming building. I don't think it deals with the question of mega scale. I think in ha my project, Habitat, was a design that grew out of, out of critique for the Cor Le Corbusier's earlier. Yeah, my slogan was, for everyone a garden. For everyone a garden. You know, high-rise building, for we've got to build in apartments, for everyone yeah. a garden. Every person in Habitat has a garden. How does he have it? We build a building that's sort of like a hill, and we mm. set back and forth. And But for everyone a garden is a is a motto. And that was sort of a reaction to Le Corbusier. You still have an apartment there? Yes. When you look at the architectural landscape today, uh, is it Asia where most of the best new things are being done because there's more opportunity to build there? I think that Asia is where there are the most opportunities. Whether we are all doing our best work there, mm. I'm not so sure. The opportunities are there. The scale, the ambition, uh, the no resources, doubt, the resources, and the trust in the sort of outside right. star architect who comes right, and right, does right, 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 right. a museum, an opera house, or whatever. I still think it's going to take some time before we, the outsiders coming there, do our best work there. I feel the same way about the Middle East. There's some great opportunities in the Gulf states, obviously. Right, right. Were you born in Haifa? Yes. And your parents moved to Canada? What happened? Yes. Uh, this was, a, for me, tragic story. In the 53, my father, who was an avid free enterprise, yeah. got fed up with the Bolsheviks, yeah. as he used to call them. And he was a merchant, and uh, he, he didn't like this socialist fervor. This was like in the 50s? Wasn't Just it? after the state was formed. 48, like so years, it was yeah, for 50s, early 50s, 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 right, right. So he and didn't the, like Ben-Gurion and all those no, he, founders of Israel. No, he did not. So <laughs> they moved to Canada, and I had to follow. I was 15. I had no yeah. choice. You, we were talking before we started this conversation about Israel, and, and how do you see the challenge to Israel in the midst of the Arab Spring and, and the most recent the demonstration of of a large number of people in the streets all over the country. The exciting news for, the week, for this week yes. is that the Arab Spring has been contagious. 150,000 Israelis are, mar are marching as we speak all over mm. Tel Aviv, Jerusalem, Haifa. Thousands of tents in asking all the... Asking for what? They're asking for social justice, social contract. They're asking for good schools, decent medicine, uh, return to the welfare state, uh, the, uh, against the polarization of income where the, you know, 15 families own most of the country and, uh, and so on. So they are challenging and they're saying things that have political implications. We don't want all the money to be spent for 4% of the population, mm -hmm. the settlements. Mm -hmm. We don't want money to go to the religious sector, to all these people who don't work because that's at our expense. We're carrying the burden. So the political impact long term global political impact long-term of, of this Israeli spring, uh, which is contagious mm -hmm. coming from the Arab spring, is formidable. At the same time, you've got the Palestinian vote coming up, perhaps, in September for statehood. You know what my dream is? What? Half a million Israelis march towards the border, half a million Palestinians simultaneously march towards the border and shake hands and exchange olive branches. What are you doing to make that happen? Start working on it. We'll start talking about it. Yeah. Is the first thing. Yeah. We'll start talking about yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned uh, Amos Oz. Yes. Had a great piece, you said, in Haaretz. Uh, 
what does he represent? He represents a liberal, sane Israel, uh, liberal in the broader sense, uh, sane in the sense of understanding the opportunity and mission of the country and reminding us there was an extraordinary story going here and is being derailed. Mm. And we must go back to these first principles. And these demonstrations are saying and doing the same thing. They're saying, we were a model welfare state. We were for a country that didn't have great contrast between the rich and the poor. We, we had were, a wonderful education. We were a place of diversity. Right. Yeah. And respect for the other. So I think that in that sense, he's the voice of the liberal uh, Zionist uh, Israeli of uh, secular of the mm -hmm. old school. But with, with contemporary meaning. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's not just... He's the most back. prominent person. He is right now sort of the moral voice of the country, exactly. I believe. It's great to see you. Good to see Thank you. you.